Hello, welcome to Greensboro Fire Department's March 2021 EMT. What we're going to talk about today, we're kind of going to do something a little different. We're going to mesh a couple of things that are important. Instead of individual classes, we're going to move it and migrate it together and take a look at it. Um, one of the first things we want to do is kind of work in and start working in these protocols um, and then the standing orders that are in those protocols because that's the responsibility that you have as an EMT and Guilford County. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to try to incorporate that from this point forward. The ones that we'll go over today are AC3, which is cardiac arrest. We'll talk about the changes and what you really need to take a look at as far as protocol is compliance is, uh, is known. Uh, chest pain, the STEMI, which is AC4. AC5, which would be congested heart failure or pulmonary edema. That would be excessive fluid in the lungs. Um, one of the things we want to always do in these classes is throw up a protocol guideline to offline patient care. So this is really a template for how you would start or initiate your assessment of patients um, in regards to that protocol. Uh, scene safety, we know all of those things, which is BSI scene safe, uh, number of patients, resources needed, uh, mechanism of injury or nature of illness, depending on what type of patient we have. And then we'd move into that uh, once we go through the doorway or once we get into the office, we take a look at that patient and we evaluate relatively quick level of consciousness and we use the AFPU system, which is alert, verbal, pain, and unresponsive. And there's going to be a scale that uh, we'll take a look at a little later on that's a tool that can help you if this patient does have some alertness to them. Uh, and then, of course, the C-spine is always something you consider. And if it's an unknown whether there's trauma, if someone found them in a position where it possibly could be trauma, we would always want to try to take that C-spine of precaution. And uh, with today's current uh, medical direction, sometimes EMS will come in and they, they not need to continue that, but uh, for us, we would do it until otherwise changed. Uh, general appearance, you know, taking a look at that patient, having a cyanotic patient, having uh, a diaphoretic patient. Those are some of the things that we want to pay attention to as regards to um, the, the, the stress level of the patient. And then of course the next section is that which has not changed since I've been in the field and that is the ABCD. The only thing that's really changed on that is going to be the D and we'll talk about that. But let's take a look at it. As we uh, get to our patient we want to assess the airway and whether there is uh, patency or not in that airway. And if if not, we have to make it patent, and that's usually your unconscious or, or uh, alert deficient patients. And we want to go ahead and assign one of the um, team members which would, to airway management. That helps take a lot of stress off that person who is doing uh, the lead patient care. Then we take a look at uh, the breathing of the patient, and we have a tool that helps us. That's the pulse ox. We want to do that at a respiratory rate, that is, count those breaths per minute, and then breath sounds very important. Wet or dry is what we're looking for, and at least uh, want to do that in six places on the chest. Circulation is pretty important in regards to um, finding a pulse and counting that pulse for one hour, and uh, also where we find that pulse, the location. If we find a radial pulse, we know we at least have a blood pressure of 90 can't find a radial and we find a brachial, we know it, we have a blood pressure of it at least 80. If we uh, have to go to the central um, pulse, that would be a carotid. And if we don't have a peripheral pulse, but we do have a central, then that means we have at least a blood pressure of 60. A person can still have a blood pressure of 40, 50, 30, and not have a detectable pulse. So just be mindful of that in regards to finding that pulse. Um, we want to do a blood glucose at this point and that will help us with any altered mental status or any patient that's sick because being too low is easily identified but being too high is a little harder to identify but uh, it also has certain problems. We'll take a look at that as we go forward. Decision making at this point, 30 seconds into this patient assessment, we should be able to determine whether or not this patient needs to be transported relatively quick to the emergency room where we have a little more time to gather some information uh, in regards to the patient. But always want to get the sample 
whether it's objectively from family members or subjectively from the patient themselves if they have uh, an alertness. Um, and then, of course, the OPQRST, which is very important uh, mnemonic, uh, but it's uh, only applied to those patients who are able to give you that response uh, with alertness um, because that's where this information comes from. It comes from the patient. And then it, it can only be applied to that patient which has pain, whether it's chest pain, abdomen pain, or limb pain. We want to make sure that uh, we're able to assess and rate that pain and what it's doing. Uh, so th that's kind of an important uh, mnemonic. Also, you can apply it to a respiratory difficulty. Uh, a secondary assessment changes from medical to trauma, and uh, it subdivides with trauma. Uh, if you have a conscious or an unconscious patient, uh, you're going to want to do a head-to-toe on the unconscious and specific injury goes straight to the arm, the leg, the abdomen, whatever complaint the patient has. Now let's take a look at those terms uh, I mentioned earlier. Online, which would be direct communication with the ER, um, there, you still have that capability but not utilized very much in today's busy world. Offline, which is a higher level of training for the EMT, paramedic, the extension of the emergency room, that, that is that we have protocols and standing orders that if this patient is uh, in that category, then that's how they'll be treated and taken to the emergency room. Just notification of, of transport would be important at that point to the emergency room. Uh, EMT's responsibilities, uh, we've, we've been taught these for many years. Assessment and treatment, that's the only two things an EMT has to do. So let's see what the new terminology we can apply. Assessment would be protocols, that is knowing what you look at and what you find. And then of course your treatment would be those standing orders. That's the responsibility of the EMT to know how to deliver care once they have a patient that fits a criteria. It's always important and we'll see a scale a little later on in the slideshow uh, in regards to being able to categorize your patients by age because uh, if you have a patient that is uh, school age, 6 to 12 years, is having chest pains, it's a whole lot different in regards to your assessment and treatment than that patient which is over the age of 85, uh, geriatric. So it, and we'll apply that in just a few minutes on a couple of slides, but it's very, very important to understand that the age of your patient is the ultimate scale in regards to your assessment and protocol. So I like to teach a lot of anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. I feel that it, it, that cognitive understanding of how it works it will help you to assess uh, and then, of course, treat going forward. So let's take a look at a couple of aspects of the cardiovascular system. Um, average 36 million beats per year for a heart to move. Um, this fluid from one side to the other. Um, some of the terminology that's associated with a cardiac patient is acute coronary syndrome, um, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, and of course angina. And you have two subdivisions of that, which would be stable and unstable. How do we how do we rate that? So I'll give you a, a small example of that. If I'm a, a patient that has cardiovascular problems, let's say I have angina, if, if I get up and run up and down some steps and start having chest pain, that's considered stable because it's expected with supply and demand. If I increase my heart uh, rate, then it's going to increase the demand of blood. Uh, which is oxygen, so that would be stable. If I'm sitting watching TV and all of a sudden I have a chest pain, uh, then that would be a more unstable, and that would be that pain which is really close to intervention medically, such as open heart, uh, stents, or medication. So those, those are two assessment tools for you out in the field in regards to these patients. Some of the terminology we've always heard, you know, the heart is, is this organ that is divided right and left um, and top and bottom. 
and then you have a preload and an afterload. And a lot of this can be applied to just simply pumping a fire seam. Uh, we'll, we'll do that in just a few minutes, but it's really all about moving volume. And that's what you do with a fire seam, house fire. So let's take a little deeper look at this and maybe compare. The heart and the human body is a pump, but it's electrically driven, whereas the, the, the pump uh, on the a uh, fire scene is a uh, centrifugal pump, which is motion, okay, that momentum. It slings, okay. Blood is the fluid that uh, the heart moves. Um, it's comprised of red, white blood cells, platelets, and then, of course, the larger part of it would be the plasma, um, which moves it. And to compare that on the fire scene, to we can compare it to water. You move water from... Uh, a fire hydrant to uh, the house where the fire is at. So we have to have a, a, a pump, we have to have uh, fluid, and we have to have vessels. And that's the last thing we look at, the blood vessels. We have arteries, veins, and capillaries. So we have a system that is connected on the other side. Um, the arteries, which is going to feed the tissue with oxygen. The veins, which is at bringing waste, carbon dioxide, back to the lungs to be excreted. And then, of course, the capillary bed, which on the other side of the system is the uh, pressure plate, or that which causes pressure uh, by a smaller container. And, of course, on the fire scene, we have the intake and the discharge and different diameter hose for that. So it's very uh, similar in regards to how it functions. We do have four chambers. We have two uh, atria, which are upper areas, and then two ventricles, which are lower areas. And then once you separate right and left, one on top of the other, you have a right atrium ventricle, which is, remember, the intake side, uh, which is a vacuum or a residual because it has to pull. Um, and then it, you have going from the right side of the heart to the lungs, which is a pressure, pulmonary pressure is that term we use medically, which causes, it's a smaller cylinder, so it forces pressure on the right side to help with vacuum, and then of course it creates the tremendous pressure on the discharge side, um, so you can get gallons per minute delivered to the organs, and that's very familiar to pumping a house fire, but just remember that concept. So pressures are, are, are key in regards to moving uh, the fluid. And this is the mechanical part of the heart. This is the four chambers and their sizes. And um, everything's electrically driven from upper right to lower left. And it squeezes and moves that um, volume of fluid to the next stage. And this, also, this slide right here shows you the SA node, the electrical conduction, how it's woven into the fibers, and it causes that contraction in the muscle. Important uh, things to know in regards to, we'll take a look at these blood vessels or, or actually the hose. It's, it's one of the most important things to a house fire. We don't really want bad hose on, on a, an engine company because it, it would just not be good at delivering the amount of gallons per minute on the nozzle or, or pressure on that side. So important things to note, two-thirds blood volume is on the, in the arteries on the left side. And some of the diameters you can see are right here in regards to sizes of those uh, uh, hoses or those pipes. And over a period of time, of course, they diminish due to aging and that deteriorates that cardiovascular system. So there you have it, comparing the age once again. So the 16-year-old's pipes are, are, have larger diameter than the 85-year-old's pipes internal part. Uh, most of the blood volume is in your pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein. And that's just a, uh, something to note. So most of your blood sits going from your uh, right side to the lungs and from your lungs back to the left side. Um, you have these uh, points where you want to try to find heart rate and assess 
forward blood pressure relatively quick in that initial assessment within 30 seconds. Uh, important uh, arteries to know. So your, your brachial is that artery which is between your bicep and tricep. That's the landmark you want to try to uh, uh, access when trying to find that. Radial is also on the thumb side down at the wrist. Uh, and the posterior tibial and the dorsalis pedis are those which are on the foot and lower leg. Um, not really something we use unless we're trying to uh, determine circulation past an injury, whether it's a fracture or uh, some type of bleeding. And w in this slide, we see how important the network being connected, connected at one side with pressure in the lung. So let's take a look at the composition of blood. We have plasma. It's more than half your blood volume. It's just something that moves. It has size to it. Red blood cells is a uh, Erythrocytes. It's uh, very important in regards to hemoglobin and getting that pulse ox reading. The darker the red blood cell, the more oxygen is believed to be on it, and that's how that works. White blood cells is uh, leukocytes, and um, that's something that works with the immune system to help keep you safe from infections and viruses. Platelets, uh, they help clot. This patient that would uh, have a heart attack would have a lot of platelets uh, influx to the heart and that's why we would give them uh, the aspirin is to help keep those clots from causing more damage. So let's take a look. We talked about peripheral pulses which are the outer parts of the body, radial, brachial, and of course the lower extremities and then the central core of the body pulses which is the carotid in the neck and the femoral which would be uh, in the pelvis area central core of the body. Let's take a look at these a little closer. Pulses near the central of the body. The carotid and femoral pulses can be uh, felt even when peripheral pulses are too weak. And here's a, a great scale in regards to your blood pressure and that uh, finding the heart rate and applying a, a, a very rough blood pressure. Radial pulse at least 90. Brachial pulse with no radial would be at least 80. Uh, if you uh, happen to find the femoral in the field, uh, you don't have a brachial, it would be 70. And then, of course, we would default to the carotid, which is 60. Um, so just kind of remember those as you go through your uh, primary assessment. Blood pressure, we know blood pressure is reflective of what? The discharge side of the pump, um, and it is the uh, working um, force that's applied against the artery and the resting force against the artery, uh, aorta. So the force of blood exerts against the walls of the blood vessels. We have systolic, which is the upper reading, and diastolic, which is the lower reading. And these can vary from patient to patient, and depending on excitability, that systolic can be affected. But the diastolic is always that uh, determining factor. We really don't like diastolic blood pressures that are over 90 consistently. Perfusion is the, uh, the uh, adequate circulation of blood and exchange of oxygen and waste products. So that is the objective of the body is to feed it and collect the waste and constantly move it out of the body and move oxygen into the body. So um, when that doesn't happen, we could have something called hypoperfusion, which means anything with hypo in front of it is lower. Um, and it also can have another term, which we, we don't like in our field, is shock. So that means that uh, tissue's not getting what it needs and waste is not getting out. So think about it. How is the function of the respiratory system related to the function of the circulatory system? Well, they both are very much connected, interwoven with each other. And if you lose your respiratory, you're going to lose your cardiovascular relatively quick. Um, so it's pretty important to understand supportive measures for respiratory helps keep supportive measures for cardiovascular. One of the things in review we want to try to understand is understanding the basic uh, physiological and psychosocial development of each age group will assist you in communicating and assessing your patients of various ages because it, it is tremendously uh, uh, 
a large difference between an 18 year old and an 82 year old going forward. Um, physiological differences between the ages will affect your care. Examples include differences in respiratory systems of a younger patient and the effect of pre-existing medical conditions of the older patients. So there's a lot more information to gather for the older patient. There's conditions and uh, things that uh, procedures that may have been done along the way that, that can play into assessing and treating your patient. So that's an important thing to be able to remember. The ultimate scale of assessment is A. Let's take a look at a critical thinking scenario. You were called for abdomen pain on a 16-year-old girl. She is with friends at a park. She seems hesitant to answer any of your questions. What characteristic of an adolescent development is most likely the cause of this and how could you overcome it? So this critical thinking problem is something that makes you think how you would approach this. A 16-year-old girl um, who is with her friends, not her parents, um, she seems very hesitant to answer questions um, and she's having some type of problem. That's why you got the call. So those, this is put into the text so you can um, start thinking about that and maybe how you would approach that. This is always good to take a look at. This is the medications that are associated um, in regards to your uh, heart patient or acute coronary syndrome problem patient that you would have, these are the standing orders. So oxygen, aspirin, and nitroglycerin are those medications that you would need to know. Indication, contraindication, side effect, and dosage. So it's kind of important. And also delivery, how you would give it, whether it's PO, pass orally, or um, sublingual. So let's start the acute coronary syndrome section. And of course, one more time, we're going to take a look at that template of guideline. Um, it, it should be always kind of put in your data bank and pop up every time you get a call. You know, the scene safety and all those uh, that go into that category, your level of consciousness relatively quick, your C-spine um, consideration for that patient that uh, may or may not have trauma. Uh, general appearance of the patient, and then the A, B, C, D. We talked about that. Um, and then the information in regards to gathering uh, pertinent information for the patient. I always try to remember that. Um, Sometimes called cardiac compromise, so there's several terms out there for acute coronary syndrome, refers to any time the heart may not be getting enough oxygen. Many different kinds of problems under the uh, ACS heading, and we'll take a look at those today. Symptoms often mimic non-cardiac conditions. In other words, you can have these symptoms that are under this category, and it could apply to respiratory or it could apply to digestive. But we have to take in uh, our, our short window of treatment, which is emergency care, um, uh, first responder, and, and we have to uh, get that information, And but it's always going to be with those symptoms, some type of heart problem, which it needs an emergency room. Treat all patients with ACS like signs and symptoms as though they are having a heart problem. So. That way we don't really uh, get in any kind of trouble in regards to uh, advising wrongly for the patient. Chest pain is best known symptom. Really it's important to try to identify that chest pain. Can it be described as crushing, dull, heavy, or squeezing? Is it sharp, which would lead me to think, take a deep breath in, uh, does it intensify or diminish it? And that would lead me down the road of respiratory chest wall problems. So there's different ways to look at this. Sometimes described only as pressure or discomfort. Squeezing tightness would definitely be of cardiac origin. Uh, radiates along the arms and down the upper abdomen 
or up into the jaw. So these are some of the traits that you'll want to be specific in regards to subjective interviewing with your patient and, and get return on that and write it down as quick as possible. Dyspnea also found in your ACS, which means they have problems breathing, they have difficulty breathing. It may be the only finding in some patients, diabetic patients. It can be fatigue and difficulty breathing, no chest pain at all. And then, of course, your females, can they could have uh, a back pain that it intensifies and runs into the right side as opposed to the left side. So there's all kinds of things that you need to document prior to EMS getting you there. Other symptoms are anxiety and of course we know uh, supply and demand so if I get anxious and my heart rate goes up then I need more blood volume and if I'm having chest pain at 60 beats when it goes to 120 beats I'm really going to have a problem. So that's really an important role for you as the EMT, as the paid professional. When people pick up the phone and they uh, call 911, they know that when you come through the door in your uniform, it's help. They don't know whether you're a doctor, a surgeon, an EMT, a paramedic. And so you being able to calm them, reassure them, uh, check certain things in your demeanor can slow their heart rate down. And by slowing their heart rate down, you're helping to what? Bide a little more time so something big doesn't happen. So um, look for that. Nausea and pain or discomfort in the upper abdomen can be one of those signs. Sudden onset of sweating, diaphoresis. Uh, abnormal pulse, tachycardic or bradycardic. Let's look at those parameters. Usually below 60 consistently would be that bradycardic and usually above uh, 100 or 110 uh, consistently would be that tachycardic that we want to look at and document that abnormality. Um, just remember the faster it goes the more volume it needs. So the bigger the fire the more water you need so it's, it's the same premise. Um, and also we want to look at those abnormal blood pressures whether it's hypotensive or hypertensive. Um, perform the primary assessment, that's your ABCD, make a decision on that, obtain and gather that history, do a physical exam, um, apply that OPQRST to this patient who has a chest pain, a back pain, or an abdomen pain, um, get to the uh, present illness in that, obtain past medical history, any problems, any surgeries uh, prior at any point in time. And then, of course, you want to get that uh, baseline vital sign uh, parameter filled out. And then you'll be able to, every five minutes or every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, go ahead and get a couple of sets and apply those or take a look at that trending of them. That's an important thing to be able to show what's going on internally. Um, management of the acute coronary syndrome, of course, patient care. Place the patient in a position of comfort. You know, typically sitting, sitting up, um, not usually laying down. Determine if oxygen is needed. And then, of course, they do need transport. But let's take a look at our protocol and what our protocol says uh, standing order-wise we can do or can't do. So here we go. Chest pain, cardiac and STEMI, that's the AC4, 12-lead ECG. And the only thing on here is that which the EMT is responsible for. You could, uh, if they qualify for aspirin, um, you would want to give them four PO, pass orally. They chew it, and that would be uh, 324 milligrams PO. Um, if they take uh, one adult, as um, some do before you arrive, that's a 325 milligrams. And of course, it says C pearls. And this is how reading the protocol is important. You'll have that standing order, and then it'll say C the pearls. So you'll have to um, refer to the lower part of the page to see what that pearl is. And here we have aspirin administration is contraindicated in pregnant patients. So that's pretty important. Uh, nitroglycerin, uh, we don't carry it, but you are allowed to assist if they need it. Um, and that is 0.4 milligrams 
per tablet repeated every five, uh, three to five minutes. Uh, if the patient has uh, a prescription, if the patient has a blood pressure greater than 100, equal to or greater, and it says see pearls, and we know that you have to ask these patients about, directly ask them if they have taken any erectile dysfunctional medication uh, within the last 36 hours. That's the template we're going to use. We're not going to differentiate between Viagra, Cialis, just any, uh, any medicine taken between uh, 36 hours prior is going to uh, eliminate us from being able to give that nitroglycerin or assist them with their nitroglycerin from this point forward. So that's an important uh, bit of information to gather, and females do take this medication, so we'll ask all patients in regards to uh, that assessment. And there's the gentleman. He's got O2 on him. Increase the saturation. Um, they're taking a blood pressure, and I'm sure they, they're going to want to administer if he qualifies um, some nitroglycerin. So here we go. Patient care. If trained, equipped, and authorized to do so, obtain a 12 lead. Follow uh, local protocols as to whether to transmit it to the hospital for interpretation. In other words, EMTs. It's always been written in our protocols. We could uh, shoot the 12 lead. We just can't read it. And we could, with technology, shoot it back to the EMS unit coming in and also the coronary unit at the hospital so they could see if it's a STEMI. Uh, way before EMS gets there. So sometimes technology um, can help us in regards to that patient assessment. Indications for administration of nitroglycerin, always important to know, chest pain, history of cardiac problems, and prescribed nitroglycerin. Physicians have prescribed nitroglycerin to the patient, and the patient has his own prescription. But you have to make sure of a couple of things. A, it's his medicine, not his wife's. Uh, it's in date. Um, and, and some of the things you'll see if it's effective nitroglycerin is that headache uh, upon taking it. They'll have a headache. And um, one of the things that is, needs to be noted is if this person has taken the nitroglycerin pills and poured them on their dresser top or, or their countertop and left them out in the sun, it deteriorates the uh, effectiveness of this medicine, so it may not be good. Uh, that's why it's in a dark bottle. Uh, indications for administration of nitroglycerin, systolic blood pressure that meets protocol criteria. We already know what that is. We read the protocol. Patients has not had uh, any type of erectile dysfunctional medication within that uh, time frame, that 36 hours. Um, medical direction authorizes administration of this medication. So they do through a standing order. We saw that. Uh, after giving one dose of nitroglycerin, repeat the dose in five minutes if they qualify. The patient experiences no relief or only partial relief. Systolic blood pressure remains greater than 90 to 100, and the medical director authorizes another one. That would be online. So let's look at indications for admi administrating an aspirin or the aspirin protocol. Chest pain, patient not allergic to aspirin, no history of asthma, and the patient not taking medications to prevent clotting. So those would be some of the things you want to pre-screen them with. And um, no other uh, contraindications to aspirin. The ability to safely swallow, they have to have. And then, of course, medical direction authorization, which we have offline through a protocol and a standing order. And this is what it looks like, chewable aspirin. We would take four, we would uh, tell them to put it in their mouth, chew it up, and swallow it. Now we're going to take a look at some causes of cardiac conditions. Heart problems caused by a number of disorders affecting condition and function of blood vessels in the heart. So this is going to open up that uh, uh, heart problem category much more in regards to what could be going on. It's not just um, ACS 
that we're looking at, we're looking at maybe some other conditions that be, could be going on. Um, coronary artery disease, you know, you have conditions that narrow or block arteries of the heart. Well, we can apply that. So if we ha are pumping a fire and we have someone park a truck on, on the intake side hose or the discharge side hose, it diminishes the amount of volume getting delivered gallons per minute to the nozzle. So that would definitely be an issue in regards to being able to put that fire out effectively quick enough. So this is kind of what we're looking at. The diameter of those blood vessels are getting smaller due to age, due to uh, medical conditions, often result from fatty deposit buildup in the inner walls of arteries. That is the left side, two-thirds blood volume at high pressure or the discharge side of the pump. Buildup narrows uh, inner vessels. A thrombosis, this is an occlusion of blood flow caused by formation of a clot on the rough inner surface of a diseased artery. In other words, it's sitting there and it's plaque and it builds up and it narrows for a short period of that blood vessel. Usually the body uh, can, can compensate for this over a period of time, but what happens is someone's pressure goes up and it breaks off and it becomes a free floating object known as an embolus. And an emboli can move to occlude the flow of blood downstream in the smaller vessels as this system is set up for pressure. Um, so it has to have those two sides of this uh, connected system. Reduced blood supply to the myocardium causes emergency uh, in a major way for cardiac related medical emergencies. Chest pain is a common symptom of reducing blood flow or supply. So it, it can appear through this disease pattern that a person has the ACS. Um, so it could be that person that is aging, 82, has this problem. It, he could have a thrombosis which broke off and become an embolus which floats to a smaller vessel and it becomes a stroke or a heart attack. So just remember that as, as we apply our anatomy and physiology. Aneurysms are something a little different. It is a weakened section of the artery walls. Um, it, what happens is uh, we have to have that inner wall elasticity. That, that inner wall will tear, um, whether it's a, a floating embolus that does it or um, a high blood pressure that's not controlled, it tears it and it bubbles into the next. We only have three layers, so that ballooning can be a problem. And you, what you see with the, these patients is you see that uh, sinkable, or they lose their blood pressure and get really dizzy and have to sit down, fainting episodes. Um, and what we don't want to happen is it, it can be life-threatening. It can cause a lot of internal bleeding because it busts open whether it's in, in, your, um, in your head or in your chest or in your abdomen, uh, and it would be a sudden loss. Because remember, on the pressure side, it's just like the hose from the discharge of the pump to the uh, nozzle. If a hole tears in it, the water's coming out, no gallons per minute at the nozzle, and it's, it's going to uh, just dump all of the water uh, before it can get to the nozzle. It's the same premise concept. And here's a picture illustrating that aneurysm that can be in different locations of the anatomy. Um, we have to take a look at the electrical malfunction of the heart because this is what drives the heart. This is what causes the pumping action of this muscle. It's no different than the uh, uh, motion of a, of a pump on the fire truck. And if you if you uh, disable that motion of that pump, if it seizes or if it tightens, it will what? It will reduce gallons per minute in regards to your nozzle. So let's take a look. Malfunctions of the heart, electrical system, generally result in a dysrhythmia. And a dysrhythmia by its definition is something that doesn't look normal. So dysrhythmias include bradycardic, which is slow, tachycardic, which is fast, and these rhythms that may present uh, when there is no pulse, which is pulses, electrical activity, PEA. 
these are some of the terms that we use in regards to the dysfunction of the electrical part of the heart. And then you have, of course, the mechanical malfunctions of the heart. So we talked about the electrical, and now we're talking about the mechanical. So you have the electrical drive, which is separate from the pump. It's the same, but it's separate in, in its task. Um, so you can have angina, stable, unstable. You can have uh, a, an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Or you can have the congestive heart failure. And if, if you remember, you can apply the congestive heart failure to that, which is when you're pumping a fire, you've emptied your tank, you fill your tank with the water coming into the intake side, and then uh, it's spilling out. You know, it's full, so that, that represents the water uh, spilling over into the lung space, and you're, you have a limited amount of time on that to get it out. Um, so let's take a look at your angina. Chest pain caused by insufficient blood flow to the myocardium, typically due to a narrowed artery, secondary to coronary artery disease. Um, pain usually during times of increased uh, myocardial oxygen demand. In other words, if I get up and run and I have that chest pain and that, that, that stable angina can be problematic if my heart doesn't come back within the normal parameters, supply and demand. So just remember that. We, we want to try to calm our patients and slow the heart rate down because if, you, if you're sitting there and you think about it, if someone tells you you're going to die in two minutes, uh, you, the excitement, the, 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 the central nervous system uh, increases the heart rate. So if you feel you, that's going to happen with chest pain, then your heart rate's going to double. And that's kind of what expediates these problems and makes them worse. So let's try to think about how we can make it better by our approach, our demeanor, and our calmness and reassurance to the patient. Uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, death to a portion of the myocardium due to lack of oxygen, lack of blood volume, because it's the same. Um, and then the coronary artery disease is usually the underlying reason or the narrowing of those hoses or blood vessels and not being able to get enough blood volume to that tissue and that's where the nitro comes in handy because it dilates those blood vessels and tries to get as much in as it can. And if the body has already started to section off that starving part of the muscle, it starts to do that with clots, and that's why we would give the aspirin. Now remember, aspirin usually does not diminish the chest pain, but the nitroglycerin should. And there's the heart, and remember, there's two aspects to damage. Uh, uh, on the heart muscle, we have not only surface space, which could be 2, 3, 12%, we also have thickness. So because if you take and turn the heart and cut it in half, you can see how thick that muscle wall is. So uh, the larger that, that area and the thicker, the more um, prone you are to having a congestive heart failure problem because the pump just can't keep up. Let's take a look. CHF, inadequate pumping of the, of the heart. In other words, it, it can't move enough fluid. The pump just can't keep up with the volume intake and the discharge. So that causes a backup, and that is that excessive spills over into the tank, which spills off and, and has run off into, onto the pavement. So it's the same theory. The pump just can't do it. It's too much volume to be moved often leads to excessive fluid buildup in the lungs, and that would be the left side because it backs up to the system of our section before. So the left side failure backs up to the lungs. The right side failure, which a lot of people have, backs up, and you'll see that with swelling to the ankles and the wrist. Um, this could be because of uh, a diseased heart valve, uh, hypertension that's not being controlled, or a, uh, an obstructive pulmonary disease. Often, it's a complication of a heart attack. The progression, the patient sustains a heart attack, myocardial on the left ventricle dies, 
um, and, and what happens is that diminishes the amount of strength and, and the contraction and if you diminish that you're gonna diminish the amount volume wise of fluid that's moved and so that will back up and like we said if, if it's left-sided failure then it backs up into the lungs and if it's right-sided failure it backs up into the body um, if untreated uh, left heart failure commonly causes right heart failure so it, it could be uh, untreated catastrophic so it, being able to pick up on it's important for us sometimes mm -hmm. signs and symptoms of this condition are going to be this tachycardic you know those heart rates that are well over 100 sustainable dyspnea which means difficulty breathing uh, cyanosis which is that uh, gray bluish um, splotchy appearance in skin, normal elevated blood pressure, diaphoresis, which is the, the person that just doesn't make sense. It's an environment that is uh, not too hot, not too cold, and that they're sweating. Pulmonary edema, um, listening to those lung sounds and hearing those uh, rails, that crackling, uh, it's pretty important to be able to pick up on that and know that uh, you have fluid building in the lungs. Now remember, uh, how do you distinguish in breath sounds between pneumonia? Pneumonia is usually on the right side. You have the rails, but the left side's clear. Unless, of course, it's double pneumonia. But pulmonary edema will always start to feel equally on both lungs. Um, and it'll go up, up, up. And just remember, default to that, you know, CPAP is one of those things that helps it in the field. Um, so if we have to and they have a lot of fluid, uh, it wouldn't be out of the arsenal of putting a BVM on them and putting pressure and pushing that fluid back to the blood vessel. If it came from the blood vessel, it'll go back to it. Um, so just remember that. Um, anxiety or confusion due to hypoxia. Pedal edema would be that right-sided failure. Engorged pulsating neck veins. It's a late sign, but it is a sign, and I've seen it so many times in the field. One of the things you want to get your patient to do if you suspect it is get them to turn to the right or the left, and that vein will stick out by itself, and you'll see it. It'll be very prominent. And uh, it, you, They could have an enlarged liver and spleen with uh, uh, abnormal uh, abdomen. So let's take a look at our uh, protocol and standing order. Congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, AC4. Um, 12 lead, of course, is that which we want to be able to obtain as soon as possible in any patient that's being treated. Nitroglycerin is that which uh, it applies to the same as ACS, that person that has a prescription that's in date, um, uh, that has not taken any erectile dysfunctional medication within the last 36 hours and has a blood pressure of 100 or higher um, and of course we want to take a look at the, the pearl in regards to this uh, the EMT may administer nitroglycerin to the patients already prescribed this medication um, this is not something I would be aggressive as an EMT in regards to uh, mild to moderate uh, distress from congestive heart failure, but those people who are in a severe state, it, it, it could be a possible treatment. It's not something that the EMT does in the field uh, on a regular basis as common as controlling ACS, but it is a protocol that we have, and you have that ability. Let's take a look at chapter view. The patients with cardiac compromise or ACS can have many different presentations. Okay, It's really important and part of your job to differentiate and write that stuff down. Some uh, complain of pressure or pain in the chest with difficulty breathing. Others may have just mild discomfort that they've ignored or it goes away and returns. So these are some of the important things to uh, obtain information wise. Between 10 to 20 percent of heart attack patients have no change, chest pain dis discomfort. So that could be your diabetics, that could uh, uh, apply to a lot different people so just remember that going forward because of these possibilities and severe complications of heart problems it is important to have a high suspicion and uh, treat patients with these symptoms of ACS
the treatment will not hurt them and may help them, which is an important thing to remember. Patients with suspected ACS who are hypoxic or short of breath need oxygen. Um, and safe transportation uh, to definitive care at the hospital. You may be able to assist patients who have their own nitroglycerin, um, thereby relieving some pain and anxiety and biding a little bit of time until other interventions can be uh, accessed. To provide maximum chance of survival for patients in cardiac arrest, EMS agencies must strengthen their performances of the chain of survival. Let's take a look at that chain, immediate recognition and activation. Very important with, uh, with uh, cardiac arrest patients. Early CPR is important. Um, rapid defibrillation, that's why defibrillators are everywhere, and we try to train as many people as we can with CPR. Uh, effective uh, advanced life support, which would be that uh, EMS unit getting there in an appropriate time frame and transporting with uh, a higher degree of, of care and integrating post-cardiac arrest care. So those are some of the important things in regards to this patient walking back out of the hospital after a heart attack. Um, the heart is a simple pump that moves deoxygenated blood to the lungs and oxygenated blood to the body. Let's just remember that. So it's about moving uh, fluid from one side to the other. Pressure within that cardiovascular system is critical in order to move the blood pressure. So let's apply it to pumping a house fire. It is so important that you keep your residual on the intake side and your pressure on the discharge side. Okay, it's just really, really important. And the only thing that's not similar is when you're pumping a fire, it's not connected. Um, it, but it is the same properties in regards to having enough water to move, uh, keeping a residual on the right side or the intake, and of course, high pressure on the discharge side. Uh, just remember, acute coronary syndrome is a blanket term that refers to a number of situations in which perfusion of the heart is inadequate. So that's really what we're getting at. It's not feeding the tissue, and it's not bringing the waste to be dumped out of the respiratory system. Although there are common symptoms to ACS, EMTs must recognize atypical findings and err on the side of caution in regards to this patient. In other words, be hyper um, vigilant in regards to treating your patients and uh, um, suspecting oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin are key medications indicated in the treatment and they're all in your protocol and you need to know when and when not to be able to use those. That's what this training is all about, this PowerPoint. However, the definitive treatment is transportation of the patient to a facility that uh, can open on a blocked artery. So that's really the important thing and letting the hospital know and taking them to the right hospital. Most cardiac conditions are caused by our arterial problems, angina, uh, acute myocardial infarction or heart attack are caused by inadequate perfusion of the heart. Uh, heart failure can be caused by either electrical or mechanical problems. The most important element of cardiac arrest care is the administration of high quality chest compressions for that CPR patient. Uh, the American Heart Association's chain of survival describes the key elements necessary to maximize the cardiac arrest patient's chance of survival. It's so important in regards to a person being able to um, have minimal brain swelling. It's got CPR. AED provides early defibrillation in the cardiac arrest patients with uh, ventricular tachycardic and ventricular fibrillation. Most cardiac arrest care is an essential element of cardiac arrest care. So it's very, very important if we get ROSC, how you manage that patient. Uh, we want to keep that pulse. Uh, mechanical CPR devices provide uh, automated chest compressions in cardiac arrest settings. We have that. So it's important for us to be able to apply that and understand the concept of primary. 
So let's take a look at critical thinking. A 78-year-old male has been complaining of severe shortness of breath 20 minutes prior to your arrival or someone calling. When you arrive, you find the patient unconscious, not moving. What are your immediate priorities? Scene safe, of course, getting to the patient, being able to access the patient on three sides, visually looking to see and checking for a pulse. If we don't have a pulse and they're not breathing, we know compressions would be one of the first things we want to start. But let's go ahead and take a look at those pupils relatively quick. Because if we have a patient that has pinpoint pupils, we know that, that patient would probably be in respiratory arrest and the heart's still beating. So if, if there's any obtaining information in regards to that narcotic overdose, we would want to go ahead and administer that as quick as possible. But if their pupils are dilated, because that's what happens when the heart stops is the shutters to the window open, then we know that we would have to start the, those compressions um, and do CPR on this patient. So just as a company, think about this scenario. Uh, take a few minutes to write it down, put it on the board, talk about it, talk about priorities, who's going to be the, who's going to be the airway management, who's going to trade off on the compressions every two minutes and who's going to get the AED ready and uh, who's obtaining information. S kind of set those goals for individual firefighters and team members.